for years, Sam had made it really difficult for the board to actually do that job by, you know, withholding information, misrepresenting things that were happening at the company, um, in some cases, outright lying to the board. Um, you know, at this point, everyone always says, like what? Give me, give me some examples. And um, I can't share all the examples, but to give a sense of sort of the kind of thing that I'm talking about, it's things like, you know, when ChatGPT came out, November 2022, the board was not informed in advance about that. We learned about ChatGPT on Twitter. Um, Sam didn't inform the board that he owned the OpenAI startup fund, even though he, you know, constantly was claiming to be an independent board member with no financial interest in the company. Um, on multiple occasions, he gave us inaccurate information about the small number of formal safety processes that the company did have in place, meaning that it was you know, basically impossible for the board to know how well those safety processes were working or what might need to change. And then, you know, a last example that I can share because it's been very widely reported relates to this paper that I wrote, um, which has been, you know, I think way overplayed in the press. The problem was that after the paper came out, Sam started lying to other board members in order to try and push me off the board. Um, so it was another example that just like really damaged our ability to, to trust him and, and actually only happened in late October last year when we were already talking pretty seriously about whether we needed to fire him. And so, you know, there's more individual examples. And for any individual case, Sam could always come up with some kind of like innocuous sounding explanation of why it wasn't a big deal or it misinterpreted or whatever. But the, you know, the end effect was that after years of this kind of thing, all four of us who fired him came to the conclusion that we just couldn't believe things that Sam was telling us. And that's a completely unworkable place to be in as a board, especially a board that is supposed to be providing independent oversight over the company, not just like, you know, helping the CEO to, to raise more money. So first of all, I got to say thank you because having followed all this, I got to say not a lot of information was coming from, from sort of from, from this side, right? In fact, everybody was kind of tight lipped, but at least we had a lot of visibility to some of the stuff that was going on, but the board, they were very tight lipped. They refused to share any information. The only thing that I remember hearing, they said the, that Sam wasn't consistently candid with the board. So we had no idea what that is, especially because they have some ties with EA, effect of altruism that also probably kind of put a lot of what was happening in a bad light because we know that, you know, EA also is not consistently candid. There was a lot of kind of cloak and dagger stuff that was happening behind the scenes. They represent themselves as one thing to get donations, but in fact, their mission is completely different. So I'm very happy that she's coming out, that she's talking about it, that she's willing to share some details because this is how we get to the bottom of this, because it's important that we know what the heck happened. Are there safety concerns? Are there issues that we as, you know, the society as humanity, like this could be potentially, and I believe it will be a massive disruptive world changing technology. So, Hey, hopefully we can know more about what's happening. So the fact that she's coming out and she's willing to talk about it is helpful. It's very helpful. So first and foremost, whatever else, thank you, you know, to Helen Toner about speaking up about, about this. And we're still waiting for more open AI safety and alignment research people that left to come back and be speak out. Now that open AI has said that they will, or they will no longer take away their equity if they, they speak out about some things that they saw. So first and foremost, I gotta say, this is good. We're, we're on the right track. Subscribe for more sweet AI content. This is an exclusive podcast interview on this show, the TED AI show. So I'm going to link a, a link down in the description. So make sure you check it out. Take a, take a look, see what you think. It's the latest episode. That is this one right here. What really went down at open AI and the future of regulation with Helen Toner. I do have the transcription right here. So let's take a look at some of the stuff that was said during this interview. It's fascinating to finally hear the other side of the story. So let's begin with this. Take a listen. Looking at the news coverage and the tweets, I got the impression she was this techno pessimist who was standing in the way of progress. And I did too. That was definitely something that I saw, the, the impression that I got. And there wasn't anything to kind of show the other side. But let's continue and see what's being discussed. So currently she's working with policymakers in DC around AI. So the board at OpenAI was different from a normal board. It was set up explicitly for the purpose of making sure that the company's was there for the public good. Its mission was coming above investors, profits, power, all those things. And this is the part that we saw on video. So 
her saying that Sam maybe made it really difficult for the board to do their job. So Helen mentions this research paper that she did. We've covered it before. It was this one, Decoding Intentions. Helen Toner is on, as you can see. And somewhere, you know, page 29, so it's kind of deep within the paper, she talks about the blockbuster release of ChatGPT, intended as a research preview, but instead became this fastest growing app of all time and created, you know, safety and ethics issues, you know, basically people criticizing OpenAI for not being safe with this technology. And she compares it to Anthropic, one of OpenAI's primary competitors, who purposely slowed down how fast they released, how fast they developed various technologies in the name of safety. And Anthropic was an offshoot of OpenAI in the early days. We don't know exactly why, but it does sound it still all was about safety. Anthropic wanted to develop more responsibly, more safe. And so a lot of people thought that that paper kind of, you can say, wasn't talking very well about OpenAI. So Helen Toner, the author of the paper, one of them, came out and kind of bad-mouthed OpenAI, or at least that was sort of the potential explanation for what was happening. We didn't know what was happening behind the scenes, but, you know, we looked at it, it so looks like, well, that probably put her on a collision course with Sam Altman, who probably did not like her publishing papers while being on the board of OpenAI that talked poorly about OpenAI. That was what we thought was happening. And she's saying that the it had nothing to do with the substance of the paper, but it sounds like Sam maybe did not like the fact that she published it. Take a listen. The way that played into what happened in November is, is pretty simple. It had nothing to do with the substance of this paper. The problem was that after the paper came out, Sam started lying to other board members in order to try and push me off the board. So it was another example that just like really damaged our ability to trust him and, and actually only happened in late October last year when we... And so she's saying that, you know, this wasn't like one big thing that Sam did, but there was just a number of little things that the end effect of which was after years of this kind of thing, all four of us who fired him came to the conclusion that we just could not believe the things that Sam was telling us. And it was just completely an unworkable place. But then later when they were talking with other various executives in the space, they seemed to be no noticing a pattern. But then in mostly in October of last year, we had this series of conversations with these executives where the two of them suddenly started telling us about their own experiences with Sam, which they hadn't felt comfortable sharing before, but telling us how they couldn't trust him, about the toxic atmosphere he was creating. One thing that's interesting to point out here is if you recall Jimmy Apples, we've covered him on this channel. He's a Twitter account, Anonymous, and he leaks a lot of information. In the beginning, people kind of dismissed a lot of the stuff that he said, but I kind of started picking up on the thing that he was very correct often before some of these things were not on anyone's radar. And in October of that year, and here's that tweet, you can see it for yourself, October 24, 2023. So this is before any of us knew about what was happening at OpenAI, before Sam Altman was fired, before it was in the news. Here's Jimmy Apple saying, there's been a vibe change at OpenAI, and we risk losing some key ride or die OpenAI employees. I just thought that was interesting, that's all. Because again, as far as we can tell, this was at that point 100% internal. Some internal strife between the board, the CEO, etc. With October potentially, you know, some outsiders being pulled in, some executives. So these executives are probably some of the higher ups within OpenAI, perhaps. You know, here they said that they used the phrase psychological they used abuse. The phrase psychological abuse, um, telling us they didn't think he was the right person to lead the company to AGI, um, telling us they had no belief that he you know, could or would change. And apparently there were screenshots of certain situations where maybe he was misleading. Really serious to the point where they actually sent us screenshots and documentation of some of the, the instances they were telling, telling us about of him lying and being manipulative in different situations. But they were concerned. That they thought that as soon as Sam had any idea that this was happening, the coup was happening, he would do everything in his power to undermine the board to prevent us from, you know, being able to fire him. And this is the interesting part, because of course, when that happened, the outpouring of love for Sam was amazing, or at least of those little heart emojis that everybody posted on Twitter saying, opening eyes, nothing without the people, without its people, etc. So why was there so much pressure to bring him back? Why was Microsoft involved? The CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella, sounds like there was an attorney general that was involved in this whole process that was calling the board the same person that put Sam Bankman Fried away, or at least, you know, prosecuted him. And of course, Sam Bankman Fried was also tied to EA somehow. Same with Helen Toner. They're both sort of have some links to that organization. They consider themselves to be part of that movement. So I, I always thought that was strange that the guy that put Sam Bankman Fried in jail is calling them now to be like, what's going on over there? 
I didn't really understand why that was happening, but here's her answer for why there was such an outpouring of love and support for Sam. And when I say love, I mean, you know, people posting heart emojis. Um, there's a lot of people that said they, they do like him. So let's see what her side of the, of the story is, because we have only heard one. Yeah, this is obviously the, the elephant in the room. And unfortunately, I think there's been a lot of misreporting on this. I think there were three big things going on that helped make sense of kind of what happened here. The first is that really pretty early on, the way the situation was being portrayed to people inside the company was you have two options. Either Sam comes back immediately with no accountability, you know, totally new board of his choosing, or the company will be destroyed. And, you know, those weren't actually the only two two options. And the, the outcome that we eventually landed on was neither of those two options. But I get why, you know, not wanting the company to be destroyed got a lot of people to to fall in line, you know, whether because they were in some cases about to make uh, a lot of money from this upcoming tender offer, or just because they loved their team, they didn't want to lose their job, they cared about the work they were doing. And of course, a lot of people didn't want the company to fall apart, you know, us, us included. The, the second thing I think it's really important to know that has really gone underreported is how scared people are to go against Sam. Um, they had experienced him retaliating against, like, retaliating against them for past instances of, of being critical. Um, they were really afraid of, you know, what might happen to them. So when some employees started to say, you know, wait, I don't want the company to fall apart. Like, let's bring back Sam. It was very hard for those people who had had terrible experiences to actually say that for fear that, you know, if, if Sam did stay in power as he ultimately did, you know, that would make their lives miserable. And I guess the last thing I would say about this is that this actually isn't a new problem for Sam. And if you look at some of the reporting that, that has come out since November, it's come out that he was actually fired from his previous job at Y Combinator, which was hushed up at the time. I did not know and that. And then, at, you know, his job before that, which was his only other job in Silicon Valley, his startup looped. Um, apparently, the management team went to the board there twice and asked the board to fire him for what they called, you know, deceptive and chaotic behavior. Deceptive if and chaotic actually look at his track record. He doesn't you know, exactly have a glowing trail of references. This wasn't a problem specific to um, the personalities on the board as much as he would love to kind of portray it that way. If you know anywhere where we can get more accurate, sort of trustworthy information about those two instances that she names, uh, please let me know in the comments. So number one, was he fired from Y Combinator and why? Number two, what happened with Looped? Because that was his first sort of startup. That's kind of what propelled him um, into this whole world. So what, what did happen there? And so here the podcast host continues. He says this. OpenAI is an example of a company that started off trying to do good, uh, but now it's moved on to a for-profit model. And really so I'm curious if people agree with that. It, it seems kind of a strange thing to say. They, they started trying to be good and then they moved to a for-profit model. I don't know if that's an accurate portrayal of what happened. It's not incorrect, but it's just not quite accurate because what happened is they wanted to initially become a small open research lab into AGI, and they quickly discovered that they're not going to have the right capital needed to develop these, these AIs, right? And it's pretty obvious now that they were correct because take a look at who has access to these AI models in terms of who can develop them. Elon Musk just announced that he's spending $6 billion on NVIDIA GPUs. Microsoft is spending also some untold billions of dollars on it. Meta, Mark Zuckerberg is spending tens of billions or has spent on the GPUs in the past. Yep. NVIDIA, the valuation of that company exploded, right? So we now know that, yes, indeed, you have to have access to billions of dollars worth of compute to build these models. I think a better way of saying that is they started out trying to be independent and not playing any of the financial games, not having corporate interests, investor interests tied in with the development of AGI. But that seems like it might be impossible unless you have, you know, billions of dollars of independent money to bring in and not trying to defend them in any way. You know, they used to be open source. They, they stopped open sourcing some of the stuff and they are now much more productized. And now they're joining forces with, you know, Microsoft and Apple, etc. My point is just they saw the writing on the wall that, hey, you need billions of dollars of GPUs to play this game. They saw that writing much earlier than everyone else did. And so next we're talking about regulation. So what kind of regulations do we need to make sure that AI is used for good? So why do we need regulations? Here's Helen Toner. There's very basic stuff for very basic forms of the technology, like if people are using it to decide who gets a loan, to decide who gets parole, um, you know, to decide who gets to buy a house, like you need that technology to work well. 
if that technology is going to be discriminatory, which AI often is, it turns out, you need to make sure that people have recourse. They can go back and say, hey, why was this decision made? If we're talking AI being used in the military, that's a whole other kettle of fish. Um, and is not, I don't know if we would say like regulation for that, but certainly you need to have guidance, rules, processes in place. And then kind of looking forward and thinking about more advanced AI systems, I think there, you know, there's a pretty wide range of potential harms that we we could well see if AI keeps getting increasingly sophisticated, you know, letting every little script kitty in their parents' basement having the hacking capabilities of, you know, a crack <laughs> NSA cell, like that's a problem. I think something that really makes AI hard for regulators to, to think about is that it is so many different things and plenty of the things don't need regulation. Like, I don't know that how Spotify decides how to make your, your playlist, the AI that they use for that. that. Like, I'm happy for Spotify to just pick whatever songs they want for me. And if they get it wrong, you know, who cares? Um, but for many, many other use cases, you want to have at least some kind of basic common sense guardrails around it. The also talk about the potential surveillance issues that we can have. So a lot of this technology is developing to where you can rapidly read footage and annotate it, describing exactly what's happening in the footage. Obviously, various facial recognition technologies to where basically, in, you know how many cameras we have out in the world right now, basically to the point where everything you do can be almost like narrated real time by AI everywhere you go, everything you do, what kind of uh, expression you have on your face, etc. Pretty common thing that comes up in the history of technology is you have some, you know, some existing thing in society and then technology makes it much faster and much cheaper and much more widely available. Like surveillance where it goes from like, oh, it used to be the case that your neighbor could see you doing something bad and go talk to the police about it. You know, it's one step up to go to, well, there's a camera, a CCTV camera, and the police can go back and check at any time. And then another step up to like, oh, actually, it's just running all the time. And there's an AI facial recognition detector on there. And maybe, you know, maybe in the future, an AI like activity detector that's also flagging, you know, this looks suspicious. Um, I, I, in some ways, there's no like qualitative change in what's happened. It's just like you could be seen doing something but I think you do also need to grapple with the fact that if it's much more ubiquitous, much cheaper, then, then the situation is different. I mean, I think with surveillance, people immediately go to the kind of law enforcement use cases. And I think it is really important to figure out what the right trade-offs are between achieving sort of law enforcement objectives and, and being able to catch criminals and, and you know, prevent bad things from happening, while also recognizing, you know, the, the huge issues that you can get if this technology is used with overreach. For example, you know, facial recognition works better and worse on different demographic groups. And so if police are, as they have been in some parts of the country, going and arresting people purely on a facial recognition match and on no other evidence. There's a story about a woman who was eight months pregnant, having contractions in a jail cell after having done absolutely nothing wrong and being arrested only on the basis of a, you know, a bad facial recognition match. So I personally don't go for, you know, the, this needs to be totally banned and no one should ever use it in any way for anything. But I think you really need to be looking at how are people using it? What happens when it goes wrong? What recourse do people have? What kind of... Yeah, those are, those are great questions. Questions. There also, I can't help but think that having AI process some of the available footage might help get criminals off the street. Might help prevent innocent people from going to jail because you know somebody pointed their finger at them, saying they did it, and it was in fact not them. Right. So you kind of also have to compare it to what we have now, right, where we use witness testimony. Certainly, I think we can get AI to the point where it would be better at recognizing people than what we have now. So again, I, I feel like there's two sides to the story about, about that. A better approach would be to actually have the data on how well does AI help or hinder our criminal justice system. By using the latest technology, do we get better at, you know, catching the bad guys, not imprisoning innocent people, how quickly our justice system moves, etc. Better technology can make it more fair. Next, they talk about scams. So, for example, somebody replicating a voice of your family member, then calling you, you know, extorting money from you in some fashion using that, which certainly is beginning to happen. And that's that is a problem that we need to address. They talk about content authentication as in, you know, if somebody posts something, you don't know if they wrote it or not, even if it looks, looks like them, sounds like them. We don't know if a human being created that or AI. And they're saying, can AI regulations protect us from all this bad stuff happening? Here's Helen Toner. Again, AI is so many different things that there's no one set of AI regulations. There's plenty of laws and, and regulations that already apply to AI. So there's a lot of concern about AI, you know, algorithmic discrimination with good reason. But in a lot of cases, there are already laws on the book saying, you know, you can't discriminate on the basis of race or gender or sexuality or whatever it might be. And so in those cases, it's not even, you don't even need to pass new laws or make new regulations. You, you just need to make sure that the agencies in question have, you know, the staffing they need. Uh, maybe they have the 
the maybe they need to have the exact authorization. Basically saying if they're breaking the laws, existing laws with the help of AI, we already have laws for that. So we don't need to completely revamp it. So which is good. I agree with that. So she talks about the organization that she's working for that they're saying, well, we're independent, so we should be allowed to have a seat at the table and kind of work to make good policy. And they do touch a bit on open source. So a lot of them are open source. You can't really put that genie back in the bottle, nor can you really start, you know, moderating how this technology is used without, I don't know, like going full 1984 and having a process on every single computer monitoring what they're doing. Uh, so how do we how do we deal with now? Some people have proposed that some people that are aligned with EA have proposed something that's global, something that's able to surveil and make sure this technology does not develop past a certain point. So Helen Tone responds. I think there are a lot of intermediate things between just total anarchy and full 1984. <laughs> um, not sure if we have full anarchy now, though. So I'm not sure why those are the two choices. So it's things like, um, you know, Hugging Face, for example, is a very popular platform for open source AI models. So Hugging Face in the past has, has delisted models that are, you know, considered to be offensive or dangerous or, or whatever it might be. And that actually does meaningfully reduce kind of the usage of those models because Hugging Face's whole deal is to make them more accessible, easier to use, easier to find. Uh, you know, depending on the specific problem we're talking about, there are things that, for example, uh, you know, social media. So she talks about companies that are making content authentication, the need to have some sort of cryptographic signatures for various models, which we, we don't know if that's even really possible, right? If you think about if you have a model, do we want to try to give the best answer or maybe an answer that's not quite as good, but has some sort of a hidden, you know, message in it so that we can know that it came from an AI model? what's more useful, you know? But a lot of this, what she's saying is very, it's kind of just general. She says, well, there's some dangers and some possibilities and stuff like that. It's not really saying anything. And so at the end he's asking, so what does the world look like with inadequate regulations? Paint a picture for us. I think there are worlds that are not that different from now where you just have automated systems doing a lot of things, uh, playing a lot of important roles in society, in some cases doing them badly and people not having the ability to, to go in and question those decisions. There's obviously this whole discourse around existential risk from AI, et cetera, et cetera. Kamala Harris had a whole speech about like, you know, if someone's, I forget the exact examples, but if someone loses access to Medicare because of an algorithmic issue, like, is that not existential for that, you know, an, mm. an elderly person? Um, you know, so, so there are already people who are being directly impacted by algorithmic systems and AI in really serious ways. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit strange to me to hear this because it's very anecdotal and it's like, well, this elderly, elderly person was, you know, abused by the AI. Kind of a, a strange way to talk about it. Why not show how much how many inefficiencies we have in our system currently because we humans are forgetful, lazy, sometimes corrupt, and then see where where we fall short, where AI could come in and, and help us a little bit. Here in the US, we spend an insane amount of money on medical services and we do not get, you know, a proportional return from it. A lot of the money gets, you know, it kind of disappears into bureaucracy, into various paperwork and insurance and all this stuff. If a doctor has to spend two, three, four hours a day filling out paperwork, that's time lost that he's not serving patients. We're already been seeing examples where AI can come in and take some of that burden off to help people. So saying that, well, an AI made a mistake, therefore just shut the whole thing down doesn't really make sense. We have to look at the marginal cost, the marginal utility. If we can use AI to decrease, you know, our medical costs 20%, but it makes a few errors here and there that we can later correct, cre create some sort of audit system to correct those errors, I, that would be a good thing for everyone. This idea that, oh, if someone loses access to Medicare because of an algorithmic issue, like, what does that even mean? Like, are they talking about a bug? Are they talking about a person no longer qualifies for something because of their, I don't know, age or something like that? Because that's not algorithmic. That's these people, the regulators are the one that set that up. Right next, she mentions uh, AI being used in the military, right? So that's her dystopian sort of world of AI, right? But the two examples that she gives, you know, our Medicare system and war are already horrible. U.S. Medicare system is not, it's not amazing. I, I think we can all agree on that. War is horrible to, to begin with. So, and again, I don't think regulations will impact the military. I mean, to me, if you ask what is a dystopian future, with AI, that is basically 1984 with AI, where everything is tracked by the government, where everything you do, say, any comment that you make is recorded. And if you say something that the current party in power doesn't agree with, 
you disappear. You get sent off to Siberia or whatever. That is my dystopian future. What's yours? Another example of a dystopian future she gives is WALL-E, which the intro to WALL-E was pretty dystopian. plausible way things could go is sort of what I think of as the, um, the WALL-E future. I don't know if you remember that movie. WALL-E is where the entire surface of the planet of Earth is basically covered in garbage and then there's this little garbage collecting robot garbage compactor that goes around just picking up garbage there's no humans everybody's off in spaceships so yes this is more of a dystopian scenario certainly the little robot and the piece that i'm talking about is not the like junk earth and whatever the piece i'm talking yeah. about is the people in that movie they just sit in their soft roll around wheelchairs all day and you know have content and um uh content and food and whatever to keep them happy and i think what worries me about that is I do think there's a really natural gradient to go towards what people want in the moment and will, you know, will go, will choose in the moment, which is different from what they, you know, will really find fulfilling or what will build kind of a meaningful life. And, and I think there's just really natural commercial incentives to build things that people sort of superficially want, but then end up with this really kind of meaningless, shallow, superficial world and potentially one where kind of most of the consequential decisions are being made by machines that have no concept of what it means to lead a meaningful life. And, you know, because how would we program that into them? Because we have no, we, we struggle to kind of put our finger on it ourselves. So I think those kinds of futures where not where there's some, you know, dramatic big uh, event, but just where we kind of gradually hand over more and more control of the future to computers that are more and more sophisticated, but that don't really have any concept of meaning or beauty or joy or fulfillment. I feel like if you talk to just regular everyday people on the street, this concern of like losing their life's mission and life's purpose, certainly that's a concern for people, but for a lot of normal everyday people that weren't born wealthy, having to work 60 hours a week, having to worry about paying the bills, not having the time to see their kids, to enjoy meaningful activities. That's probably a more pressing reality that, you know, s sucks their will to live away from them. And it's something that they have to deal with a lot more than some faraway idea of living on a spaceship, consuming content and having food fit into your mouth. I feel like for most people, if you're working and trying to survive, if we can reduce that to a more manageable time where you can work less and have more free time, you would find more fulfillment in your life. You would find more meaning because you can go and see nature and go to the beach, to the river. You can go see a show, a play, a movie. You can work out more. You can cook. You can live a better life, I, I think. I don't know. You know, Bill Gates kind of said something along the same lines. He's like, he's really worried about the fact that his life will have less meaning because there's not going to be a scarcity, scarcity of intellect. AI is going to be able to achieve the various missions that he says better than he himself could. He could just take care of malaria or whatever other diseases. That was his concern. But again, he's a billionaire. For the vast majority of the people, their concerns are more like, how do I pay the rent? How do I make sure that I can feed my kids, my family? And hopefully, how can I do all that while having some time that's left to myself to enjoy the things that I like doing? How do I live a quote-unquote balanced life? Keep in mind that most people that are linked to EA come from extremely wealthy families. I don't know Helen Toner's background, but in general, these aren't like people from all strata of society, right? It's only the people that were born into wealth or into the upper class, whatever you want to call it. So maybe they don't have the same perspective as everyone else. And then she's asked to describe, well, what is the best case scenario? What is the utopia? What what can AI provide for us that would make life amazing? Let's take a listen. I mean, I think a, a very basic place to start is can we solve some of the big problems in the world? And I do think that AI could help with those. So can we have a world um, without climate change, a world with much more abundant energy that is much more, you know, cheaper and therefore more people can have more access to it, um, where, you know, we have better agriculture, so there's greater access to food. And beyond that, you know, I, I think I think what I'm more interested in is is setting, you know, our our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids up to be to be deciding for themselves what what they want the future to look like from there, um, rather than having kind of some particular vision of, of where it should go. Um, but I, I I absolutely think that that AI has the potential to really contribute to solving some of the biggest problems that I'm not sure how this last part about our grandkids deciding for themselves, like, I'm not sure that's 
utopia because of AI. That's more like, again, she's saying, oh, I just don't want AI to take everything over. Not again, I don't think this is the upside of AI. I think this is her just kind of hitting her talking points again. All right. So that's her take. There's a lot more, but it, there's nothing really that stands out to me as super important. A lot of it is pretty kind of like the the basic talking points of, you know, we have, we need to regulate content. We need to not be intimidated by technology. Here's my take. Here's my honest take. I always try to be open-minded and try to be non-biased and trying to cover all sides of the issue. But here, I think the problem is that some of these organizations are fundamentally not saying the truth. They have a goal. They have a very specific goal and they're training the various people in that organization how to achieve that goal and what to say to achieve that goal. So it's important to understand that the message is tailored to get you, the listener, to believe something, to say, oh, they're right. That's That sounds very reasonable. So it's important to listen to people that are fighting for AI safety, that want to make sure that everything is safe and tested before it gets rolled out to the world. I certainly agree with that. But unfortunately, it does seem like there are groups that are involved in these AI safety debates that maybe don't have the same goals and intentions as the rest of us do. So a great person to follow on Twitter is Dr. Tech Lash, or Dr. Tech Lash, I guess, who covers a lot of the stuff that's happening behind the scenes, right? So Vitalik Buterin donates, I think at the peak, it was nearly a billion. It was, or it was like seven or 800 million because he donated as cryptocurrency. It fluctuated widely, but here they're saying 665 million crypto war chest royals over AI safety fight, right? So this is funding the Future of Life Institute, one of the big sort of organizations pushing through these AI safety regulations. And that institute funds other AI existential risk organizations and created new ones, right? So effective altruism, AI existential risk, they have over a billion dollars in funding. Here's a post from lesswrong.com. So a place where a lot of the people concerned with AI safety talk about this stuff among other things, but some of the people are saying that AI safety, this whole movement is too structurally power seeking, right? They're trying to raise money, trying to gain influence in corporations and governments. We've seen a lot of people from EA try to join various government organizations and corporations in the space to try to wield power within them, right? They favor other people that have the same concerns and they maintain the secrecy of information. They also use certain jargony and sci-fi language, right? The rationalists, as they think of themselves, wanted to only work with those who see things the same way as them and avoid too many dumb people getting involved. She recalled conversation with some AI safety people who lamented that there were too many stupid or irrational newbies flooding into AI safety now. And AI safety sphere isn't as fun as it was in the past. There's a lot of hero worship towards people like Eliza Yudkowsky. And so it's concerning that our ability to craft these policies of AI safety is resting on judgments of such a small number of people. And the problem here is that they say one thing and believe another. Here's Eliza Yudkowsky. I regard the non-X risk parts of EA. So what is the X risk? This is the actual thing that they're concerned with. This is the actual mission. They believe that AI will almost with 100% probability destroy everyone. So kind of a Terminator scenario, right? Or it will turn us all into paper clips. There's a whole story related to that. But the point is they believe that AI, if we don't fully stop it, a complete global stoppage of the development of this technology will certainly kill everybody on the planet. That's the X risk, X is existential. So it's the risk of a complete end to humanity's existence, right? So he's saying the non-X risk parts, the, the actual thing that we're doing and everything else in the EA movement is important only insofar as they raise visibility and eventually get more people involved. As he would put it, the actual plot, the actual plot being, you know, not having us all turn into paper clips because of AI. Eliza Tkoski, as I've said repeatedly, x cannot be the public face of EA. Animal altruism can't be the public face of EA. Only sending money to Africa is immediately comprehensible as good, and only an immediately comprehensible good can make up for the terrible PR 
profile of maximization or cause neutrality. And putting AI in there is just shooting yourself in the foot, right? They even talk about how to sort of change the effect of altruism's clustering of beliefs, right? So they have so many weird beliefs, or by weird, I don't want to say that they're weird. It's just they're things that not everybody's going to agree with. Maybe you will and I won't, or vice versa. It doesn't matter. The point is a lot of them are kind of clustered within this organization. You know, here's another thing that I think kind of illustrates really well the double rhetoric. So you have the core EA. So this is what they talk to about to each other. So if you're cool, if you're on the inner circle, they're worried about X risk, right? Everybody dying from AI, right? Helping elite students get advanced degrees has a better expected value than helping the global poor, right? So smart people, if we get them educated, they will have a greater good on the world than, you know, helping people that are struggling, right? And again, if whether you agree or disagree with it, it's important to understand that that's the language that's used on the inside, whereas the things that are used on the outside is different. The things that they will tell you they care about is improve school outcomes, help children, you know, help blind people, donate money to nonprofits, right? Help the poor, needy, and vulnerable, et cetera. So when I'm looking through Helen Tone's interview, that's kind of what it reads to me as. If you notice, what was she talking about as the things that are concerning to her, right? So a poor elderly person losing their Medicare a pregnant woman being put to jail because of face recognition technology, and then climate change and energy and having a life's meaning, right? So my question is that what she really believes or is that this public facing thing, is that what she thinks you believe? Is that what she thinks if she says it to you, you'd be like, oh, she's right. I do care about those things. Let me help her give her power to make these regulations because she says the things that I agree with. The problem with that is routinely, it seems like they misappropriate funds, the donations given to them for their pet causes, their core causes, right? Right. They're saying here that, you know, this report in summary, do not accuse EA of fraudulent fundraising practices. Clearly donations earmarked for Against Malaria Foundation go to the Against Malaria Foundation. This analysis explains the EA movement's rhetoric and recruitment which emphasizes the digestible mainstream cause, you know, poverty, and conceals the less digestible, less mainstream cause, rogue AI, right? That X risk they've been talking about. This is why the headlines are about double rhetoric and brand management. The Center for Effective Altruism Funnel Mode illustrates beautifully how different messages are targeted at different audiences. Keeping a relatively non-controversial public face as the deliberate strategy while converting newcomers to more controversial core EA ideas, that's the bait and switch here. And actually, after recording this, I wanted to jump in here because I just remembered about this little gem. So this is notes from Sam Bankman-Fried. He was the person that was put in prison because of the FTX collapse, like a lot of people lost, lost billions of dollars in the collapse. He was the founder. He's also part of EA. And shortly before the trial, I guess, before going to jail, here are his notes about how to kind of get the public on his side, how to change the public perception. So just some things to try that he's willing to say to kind of get out of the situation. So he's talking about getting interviewed on ABC, blaming it on Alameda, Alameda was incompetent message, which I guess I think it was also one of his little institutes, one of his little companies that he set up, come out as extremely pro-crypto, pro-freedom. Also saying that the lawyers that will take over FTX's chapter 11 team, right? It's colonial, right? It's run by a cartel of lawyers, right? So that might appeal to a certain audience, right? That's number six. Number three is go on Tucker Carlson, come out as a Republican, come out against the woke agenda, and somewhere towards the end here, he's also talking about radical honesty on Twitter and try to get people to support the true narrative. So whatever those those things are, that those sound maybe they're more in line with what happened. But most of this other stuff seems like it's just say whatever it takes to get people to like me or believe in what I'm doing. That just seems to be the kind of the MO. What you say doesn't actually have to match in any way to your actual mission. You just say whatever is best to get ahead, whatever has the highest perceived value, highest perceived chance of getting you to where you're going. The real reasons for what you're doing are only to be shared among the whole group of people, right? The people that are smart enough to understand it. I honestly don't know. It's hard to tell. I just got to say that because of some of the stuff that's surrounding EA, it's really hard to tell what's true and what's not. That, by the way, is the problem. When you start out lying, 
and you make that the policy, later on, even if you come out and start telling the truth, people have no idea if it's the truth or not. I went into this interview hoping that we'll get some real ideas, some real sort of conversation about what happened, some answers. I, I don't think we're getting actual answers here. I think we're getting this public-facing EA messaging, right? In that, in that interview she's talking about, again, you know, old people losing, this one old lady losing Medicare, this poor pregnant woman in jail, right? So that is the thing that she's saying that she is about because she believes that it's easier for you to digest and believe that information. That's the bait, right? And then the switch is the AI doomerism. And we've covered some of the things that other people that are kind of linked to those organizations have said before, some of whom, and I don't know if they're the mainstream opinion in those circles or not, but potentially having just a global sort of government that is able to control the nations to make sure they don't develop AI. So I would encourage everyone to listen to this interview. If you disagree, I'd, I'm happy to hear it. I'm open to other opinions. If Helen Toner appears on other podcasts, I will listen to that as well. Currently, I got to say with a lot of this, it feels like their belief is that their their, their small group of people are smart enough to understand these things that the rest of the population, the, the everyone else just is incapable of understanding, which is that AI will kill everybody with 100% certainty and that their sort of mission in life, what they must achieve at any cost is to lie and deceive their, their way into power to put forth these regulations to stop AI from progressing. And the really unfortunate thing here is that this corrupts the actual AI safety debate. We do need to deploy this technology safely. We do need people that are not cultish, that are not fanatical. We do need those people to work on AI safety to make sure that it doesn't do harm. It is a very powerful technology. It's not to be messed around with. But the people that believe that there's a 100% chance that it'll kill everybody unless we create a world government to stop it, those are not the people that I would want setting those policies. And I don't think you would either. So those are just my two cents. I hope you enjoyed that. My name is Wes Roth, and thank you for watching.